Mike Moyer, and thank you very much for having me at Brazil Empreendedorismo. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, I'm broadcasting from Lake Forest, Illinois, which is where I live, which is north of Chicago, and it's extremely cold here. But today we're going to talk about uh, slicing pie, which is a methodology, a method for determining perfectly fair equity splits in startup companies, in bootstrapped startup companies. Uh, most of the time, uh, people do traditional splits, which, which based is based on guessing about how their equities will be split, negotiation skills, or rules of thumb that experts tell them. But I'm going to give you a method for determining always exactly how much equ equity each person deserves in your startup company, no more and no less. Uh, my Twitter is Grunt Funds, and if you want a copy of these slides, go to slicingpie.com slash feedback, and you can download a copy of uh, this, this presentation deck. The first thing I always ask people when they go into startup companies is why do they do it? Why do you want to start a company? And I get lots of answers. People want to be their own boss. They want to have a positive impact on the world. They want to change the world in a positive way. They got a vision for the future. Or maybe they have a passion. Whatever it is, they always want to enjoy their lives in a better way. And startups are always seem to be a draw for that reason. So they, what I think is one of the core tenets about starting a company is they want it to be fun. So people think that they work hard, and they'll have fun along the way, and they'll get a great big payout someday down the road. The problem is we don't know what that payout will be, or what it is, or what it's going to be. No one has any idea. So we do financial projections to try to guess what that's going to be, or we'll, um, we'll do uh, valuations, or we'll determine all, there's all kinds of tricks we do to, to try to figure that is, out what that is, but we have no real idea what that actually is. So I think that successful company has two criteria. The first one is lots of money, whatever that happens to be. And the second one is that I get my fair share and you get your fair share. As long as we all get our fair share, we'll all be successful. Because fair equals fun. Which brings me to what I call the perfectly fair equity calculation. Which is that your share should equal the value of your contribution divided by the total value of the organization at any given time. Now, there's inherent problems with this. The first problem is it gives us what's called a fixed equity split. A fixed equity split is an equity split that's doled out in the beginning at the outset of the venture in anticipation of work being performed. It's given out in chunks so it doesn't change over time. So whenever we have to change something by the organization, we have to renegotiate it. 67% of all companies, 67% split up equity in the beginning. They have their founding team of three or four people, they split up the equity and they go on their merry way. 90% of these companies do equal equity splits. An equal equity split would be like going in 50-50, which is extremely common, or split it a third, a third, a third among three partners, or divided at 25%, 25%, 25%. Equal splits are the most common way to do this. And it's just because people don't know what else to do. So if they think it sounds okay, split things 50-50, but it rarely, if ever, works out that way. Sometimes they'll and see that one person maybe gave more to the company than the other, so they'll do a 60-40, or one person wants to maintain control, and they'll do 51%, 49%, um, or 25%, 30%, 45 whatever the split happens to be. Fixed equity splits are doling out equity in advance of work being done in anticipation of work being done. But what if things change, which they always do? What if you do all the work and your partner does nothing? Or what if you want to bring in another person? Let's say you're an engineer and I'm a marketing person, and we want, I want to bring in another marketing person. Do I take equity out of my share, or do we take it out of your share or both of our shares? So th that's, that leads to another difficult conversation. Or if your partner wants to quit, or if you want to quit, or if your CTO gets hit by a bus. There's millions of things that change in startup companies. Your strategy changes, your team changes, everything always changes. The only thing that never changes is the fact that startups are always changing. So when, when something changes in your organization, one of these things will be true. The first one is that your share is less than, this little less than sign right here, is less than the value of your contribution, which means you're getting more than your fair share. And sometimes people are okay with this. They figure, okay, if things are going to go badly, at least they'll go badly in my favor. The other problem is when thing, people get less than their fair share, that means the value you're getting less than what you deserve, less than the value of your contribution divided by the total value, which means you're getting less than your fair share. Someone else is at the expense of somebody else. Somebody else is getting more, and you're getting less. And very few people are okay with this. They want to get at least what they deserve, uh, hopefully more. But either way, I call these alligator pit negotiations. An alligator pit negotiation 
is one that has less than alligators, meaning you're going to have less than you deserve, or greater than alligators, which means you're going to have more than you deserve. And I call it an alligator pit because you approach the alligator pit with self-preservation in mind, fear, anxiety, sometimes anger. It's not a good way to communicate with your co-founders. It creates animosity, it creates stress, it creates bad blood, it creates friction between you and your co-founders. And if you have a fixed equity split, you'll always be going back to have a renegotiation because you're always going to change your equity split. And you're going to have to have your lawyer draft new documents and everyone's going to have to sign them. It's a big hassle. And then they won't be fair ultimately. So if it's not fair, it's not fun. So what we need is what's is a program that's perfectly fair. I want to give you a perfect system. I call this a universal one-size-fits-all solution for all bootstrap startup companies. It's got to reward the actual contributions people don't make, not what they say they're going to do, but they actually do. We want to provide ongoing motivation for continued involvement. We want to accommodate people coming and going, the changes in the team. We want to be flexible in the face of rapid change. We don't want to go back to our attorney every time we make a change in our equity split. And you want to get rid of the gators. We don't want to have to renegotiate with fear and self-preservation in mind. We want a system that we know we're all going to get treated fairly under. The system is called a dynamic equity split. And a dynamic equity split is a form of equity split that ensures that everyone stays fair all the time. And this was uh, researched by a bunch of guys at Harvard. They realized that dynamic equity splits are the way to go. Um, they didn't. What I'm going to do today is explain exactly how to implement a dynamic equity split. So if you contribute half of what it takes to get there, you should get half what it takes to get there. If you contribute 10%, you should get 10%. You should always have exactly what you deserve, no more and no less. If it's fair, it'll be fun. The model I've designed is called a grunt fund, and there's two pieces to the grunt fund. The first piece is called the allocation framework. The allocation framework determines how you allocate or give stock or give equity to your founders and employees and investors. It determines the fair share of what you deserve. The second piece is the recovery framework. When somebody leaves your company, you need a means for recovering the equity so you don't have outstanding shareholders that are no longer involved with the company. You can't always avoid that, but if you can, it's best, best you. So the recovery framework will determine the buyout price, if any, for the equity that you've given out. And so here's how it works. The first thing you've got to keep in mind is that risk is tied to return. And when people work for startup companies, they're accepting risk. And the risk is very specific. The risk is equal to what they would otherwise have been paid for that same contribution to somebody else's company. So if I am a web developer and you hire me full time to do web development, I'm risking what somebody else would pay me for, web develop for the same kind of web development. So if I normally get $100,000 a year and you pay me nothing, I'm risking $100,000 a year. So everything, this is called a fair market value. This is what I'm worth on the open market. Everything has a fair market value. So if I put a, a dollar in, then I sh and that, the, the fair market value of the dollar is a dollar. If I put a truck in or some equipment, the fair market value could be the price I paid for the truck or the resale value. If I'm a salesperson, typically salespeople are rewarded through commissions on their sales. So the fair market value of a salesperson's sale is a commission. If I am an inventor of intellectual property, if I have an idea that's great from an author of a story or I write a song, the fair market value of that intellectual property is royalties on the revenue that it generates. So if I have an idea, I don't get paid up front, I, get, I usually get paid a royalty. So everything has a fair market value. And that's what's being risked when it's put into a startup company. And the risk is extremely high. In fact, most startups go out of business. The, the risk for investing in a startup is as, about as high risk as you can take with your investment. So when someone puts money into a startup, they're making a bet. They're betting that that startup's going to produce. And the amount of their bet is what's important here. That's what they're risking. So here's how the allocation framework works. The first thing you do is you sign a proxy value, a substitute value to the various inputs. I call them slices. A slice is a fictional unit, fictional unit of risk that allows us to determine how much risk somebody took on a, on a, per, on a, on a startup company. So everything is converted into slices. So your share is determined by the number of slices you contribute divided by the number of shares that everybody contributes. This will always give you exactly what you want. And it adjusts over time. So as more risk is taken, the pie will change. So the dynamic equity split works by taking the number of slices you contributed divided by the total slices that everybody contributed. And here's how it works. First thing you got to do is convert to slices. There's two kinds of contributions. There's non-cash contributions, which include things like time, ideas, 
uh, facilities like a like office space or warehouses, relationships that someone might bring with them. And there are cash contributions. Cash contribution is actual cash investments as it's spent or unreimbursed expenses. It's important to note that cash is only at risk when it's spent. So I could give you a thousand dollars. If it's sitting in the savings account, it's not really at risk. When you spend that thousand dollars on the company, it becomes at risk. So you convert everything to slices and here's how it converts. First thing you do is take a fair market value. The fair market value is whatever you're risking or whatever the cash is worth. Then you apply a multiplier. And a multiplier, the multiplier assigns a risk premium to that slice, to that value. So when you put a hundred, uh, when you put your salary at risk, it's at such high risk, I call that a two times multiple. So you get two slices for every dollar you put at risk for non-cash contributions. But cash is harder to come by. Cash is more important and startups need it more. So you have to give it, it a higher risk multiplier. It's, it's easier to save, to earn a dollar than it is to save a dollar. So cash I multiply by four. So slice is equal to the amount of cash you can, that is consumed by the company times four. So for instance, I take my, for time, time is a non-cash contribution. I take the fair market salary that I would normally be paid. I subtract any cash compensation that I would be paid because it's not a risk if I'm actually getting paid. I multiply it by two, I divide by 2,000, which is roughly the number of hours in a year, it gives me my grunt hourly resource rate, or my hourly rate in slices. So for instance, let's say I make $100,000 in the open market, and you as, as a startup founder pay me $25,000. That means I'm not, I'm, that 25,000 is no longer at risk. So you multiply what is at risk, the 75, times two, divide that by 2,000, and that gives me a grunt hourly resource rate of 75 slices per hour. Small amounts of money that are spent on the company, I put the, the amount of money times four, and it gives me the number of slices for cash. For equipment, if I put a, like a truck, for instance, or a printing press, or a copy, or a computer equipment in, in the startup, if I purchase it for the company, I treat it as a cash expense, because cash is consumed, that's times two, or times four. If it's less than a year old, but I already owned it, it's treated as a non-cash contribution, so it's times two. If it's older than a year, I use the blue book value, or the, the resale value. Everything converts. So if I'm a salesperson, I generate a sale. The fair market value is the unpaid commission. It's a non-cash contribution, so I multiply it by two. Unpaid royalties, if I'm invent, uh, invent the IP, intellectual property for the company, I multiply that by two as unpaid royalty to reflect the fact that I'm not getting paid that problem. Uh, supplies and uh, small amounts of equipment is unreimbursed expenses, so I multiply that by four. I have complete cheat sheet on, the, on my website and you can download that tells you all the calculations for all the different contributions. So here's how it works. Let's say we have three different participants. I'll call them grunt one, two, and three. We have the junior developer who is just out of college and he's putting in development time building the website. We have the founder of the organization who is putting in time, ideas, and equipment. And we're putting, we have the rich uncle who's putting in credit cards, cash, and making some important introductions. All you do is to convert everything to slices everyone's contribution. So this is the grunt one's contribution, grunt two, and grunt three. That gives you your base value. And to determine each person's share, you simply divide each person by that base value. So here's grunt number one share, grunt number two, grunt number three. And this gives you your pie. So it makes logical sense that the junior developer would have a smaller share than the rich uncle who put up all the cash and made all the introductions. It also makes sense that the founder who just brought ideas and some equipment would have less than the person who bankrolled the, the organization. So this pie makes sense. Now let's say we want to add somebody. We want to add a fourth person. This is a salesperson with a lot of good ideas for sales. So all we do is we add what that person produced into the base and recalculate everyone's shares. Here's grunt number one, grunt number two, grunt number three, and grunt number four. Now this assumes that nobody else did any more work that particular period, which isn't always the, the real case, but the pie reallocates. So in this case, the salesperson now has entered the pie at 13%. The junior developer, the founder, the uncle now all have less, but the company's worth more. The pie is bigger because now they're generating actual revenue, which is exciting and the, the direction you should be going. So the pie is automatically reallocated based on the new person entering and how much contribution they made. So even though the shares are different, everyone has exactly what they deserve at this point in time. The next thing I want to talk about is the recovery framework. This is how do you get shares back when somebody leaves a company. 
There are four reasons why somebody can leave. You can be you can be fired for good reason, which is box A. Fired for good reason means you uh, weren't doing your job, and you got two warnings. You're warn warn warning warning fired. You can't fire somebody without giving them a warning. You can't fire them for good reason. You're not giving them a warning. If they bring a gun to work or threaten somebody or sexually harass somebody, that's that's good reason for the company to fire them. In both those cases, the individual has made decisions that negatively impact the future of the company, and so they've been fired for good reason. The other reason someone can be fired is for no good reason. No good reason means there's no lot, there's, the person didn't do anything to negatively impact the future of the company. The management team just decided to fire them. So you can fire someone for pretty much whatever you want to, um, but if it's not performance related or because they made decisions, bad decisions about what their, their behavior, then there's different consequences for that. So in this case, the company made decisions that negatively impact the future of the employee, and the employee deserves and should get protection from that. The next reason you can be fired is you can resign for good reason. If the company moves from Brazil to Chicago, uh, it's a, the comp you would have a good reason to leave the company. If the company changed your job from marketing manager to floor washer, you'd have a good reason to leave the company. It's not what you signed up for. And the last reason is resigning for no good reason, meaning you have your own personal reasons to leave the company. Like you have a new job where you can't afford to work for free anymore and you don't believe in the future of the company anymore. Whatever reason you have is resigning for no good reason. So if you're fired for good reason, box A, or you resign for no good reason, you are making decisions that negatively impact the future of the company. And you should have consequences. In box B and C, the company is making decisions that negatively impact your future and they should experience consequences for doing that to you. So here's how it works. If you're fired for good reason, or you resign for no good reason, you lose all the pie, all the slices that you earn for non-cash contributions. And we remove the multiplier, the cash or tangible property, and the, and the buyback price is equal to the amount of cash or tangible property you put in. So if you can buy you back, that's the buyout price. It's painful to leave the company under these circumstances, as it should be, because you've made decisions that leave the company in a bad position. Employees should think twice before they leave a company. And this will ensure that they think twice about the consequences of their actions before they leave the company. Now, on the opposite way, if you are fired for no good reason or you resign for good reason, the company has made decisions that negatively impact your future, and the company should think twice before letting people go under those circumstances. So there should be consequences for the company, and there are. In these scenarios, you keep all the slices that you earned. And the value of, of the buyback is this number of slices times the dollar amount. So if I contributed $100,000 a year for, for worth of work, you, should, you had to pay me $200,000 to get my shares back, which is perfectly fair. I, get, I took the risk. I get my risk premium. I did nothing. I did what my job was, and you let me go for no reason. So it's really important in the recovery framework that the, peop, the person causing the separation receive the consequences for making that decision. So let me show you how that works. So here's our team, and let's say we have our grant number one is not performing. It's the junior developer. We say, you're not performing. Please shape up. And we give him another warning the following week, and he still doesn't shape up. For the third time, he's fired. So all we do is remove his contribution from the base value and recalculate everyone's share. So here's grunt number two, grunt number three, and grunt number four. So here's the, the new pie. The new pie shows everyone has a slightly higher percentage, but the overall pie is smaller because that person left the company. Now we have to hire a new developer. So people are, have, might have a different share, but it's not, they're not necessarily better off. But the pie is reallocated perfectly to determine exactly what everyone deserves at that given time. Remember, the person leaving, because they weren't doing their job, they lose their shares, and all the guy put in was time, so the shares are no longer counted in the, in the pie. Now, eventually, you don't want to freeze the pie. The, free, the pie means the freezing the pie means it no longer changes dynamically. It's sort of frozen in time. Freezing the pie happens when you can just afford to pay someone. If you can just pay people the fair market value of their contribution, you don't have to use any equity whatsoever. But if you don't have that, you have to use equity. But if you eventually get the money to pay people, you can use that money to pay people. So the best way is to generate revenues. If you generate revenues, you can start paying people for their contributions. The first thing you want to pay for are 
cash contribution, so the company can use their own cash instead of personal cash, that's a four times multiplier. Then you pay people for their, their non-cash contributions. Or if you get Series A investment. And Series A investment, in my point of view, is enough money to pay all your immediate cash needs. So here's how it works. Here's the impact of paying people. So if you're someone who normally earns $100,000 a year, and I pay you $0 per year, your hourly rate is 100 slices per hour. So under that scenario, every hour you work gets 100, you get you 100, 100 slices. But if I pay you 25,000 slices out of that 100,000, now your hourly rate is reduced to 75 slices per hour. If I pay you $50,000, your risk is further reduced. So now your, your hourly rate is 50 slices per hour. If I pay you 75,000, it's reduced to 25 slices per hour. If I pay you $100,000, you're not taking any risk whatsoever and your hourly rate has re reduced to zero slices per hour. So for every incremental hour you work, you earn you zero slices. So when that happens, the pie no longer mo moves because everyone's getting paid. And when profits or proceeds of a sale come in, you simply distribute those profits according to the ownership of the pie. Now let's say you get a Series A investor. Let's say you negotiate a $900,000 pre-money valuation and you raise a million dollars. $100,000 plus $900,000 is $1.9 million, which gives you a post-money valuation of $1.9 million, which gives your Series A investor 53% of your company. Everybody else has been diluted down accordingly, but the pie is still fair based on what they deserve in the first place. And now when proceeds or, sale or profits come in, you simply distribute them according to, to, that, to the shareholders that are in the pie. So now the Series A investor is getting their piece of the action as they should. So what the model gives you is a perfectly fair equity split. It's rewarding your actual contributions, not what you say you're going to do, what you actually do. It's providing motivation to, for continued involvement. You're accommodating changes to the team. I showed you how to take somebody out and put somebody in. It's flexible in the face of rapid change. It changes automatically. We don't have to renegotiate or go back to our attorneys for new contracts. And we never have to sit down and renegotiate under, under stress thinking we're going to get short cheated. So there's a number of resources that are available on this topic. According to my, of course, I have a book called Slicing Pie. There's also a shorter book called Get Them Gator, which helps make the case and convince people to use Slicing Pie. It's 12 pages long. If people don't want to read the 12 pages, they can read the last page, which is a one-page summary. There's also a book called Fair and Square, which comes with the online software. There's an Excel spreadsheet on my website that you can use to track your contributions and make sure everyone gets what they deserve. There's also a piece of software at, at slicingpie.com that allows people to make their own contributions and automatically calculates the value of everything. Um, and also at Slicing Pie are lawyers, uh, agreement templates, video, anything I could do to help people be successful in this program, I try to provide uh, on slicingpie.com. Um, also, just for your uh, information, I've written other books about selling uh, trade shows and how to pitch a presentation, and I uh, encourage you to take a look at those. Um, but that's, my, that's the model. If you've got any questions, please email me at mike at slicingpie.com or visit the website, uh, and so you can, I'll be happy to give you a copy of the slide.